First off, if you guys will help me out, how many people here already have Lightroom 5? Oh, great, okay. Who's got Lightroom 4? Whoa. Who's still on Lightroom 3? All right, anybody on Lightroom 2? Up Rat, security, hopefully. that woman right there. Okay. No, no, it's you. Not, don't look around, it's you. No, <laughs> no, it's okay. Hey, well, so, so here's the good news. Lightroom's cheaper than when you bought it. Yeah. So <laughs> it's about half price, so that's good news. All right, also one last question. Who's not going to raise their hand regardless of what I ask? Okay, good. All right, okay. So um, they let me go first, and what I'm going to do is um, each of us are taking parts of Lightroom, and um, I'm taking all the easy parts. I'll give them all the hard parts. Um, but uh, I, I want to show you what's new, but I, a lot of you already have Lightroom 5. A lot of you have seen Lightroom 5. It's been in public beta for two months. Um, it just actually shipped this week, which is an exciting time. I always call the day that, um, that it ships uh, is it's kind of a, a good day and a bad day at the same time. It's a good day because it's actually shipping, but it's a bad day because the thing that you'll be using for two months for free, you now have to pay for. So, uh, but it is actually out there shipping, so if you want to get Lightroom 5, uh, it's, it's, it's cheap. Okay, now, I'm going to show two things, but I don't want to just show you the features because I've got to show you some other stuff too, because we really want to learn about Lightroom all day long, so I'm not just going to show you the first one, which is the healing brush, because you know there's a healing brush in there, and I will show you basically how it works for any of you who haven't seen it, but, um, but I'm not going to do it actually in Photoshop. I will actually use Lightroom. Let me switch over to Lightroom here. All right. So the healing brush, all right. So you know what the, the, the spot healing brush has always done? It's done what we call circular healing. So it made a circle and it drew another circle and what was ever inside that circle, it healed. So let's just zoom in a little bit. For example, if you had to get rid of something like a little spot over here, right? You could go to the develop module and grab the, here let me just close this other thing. Let's see in there. You had to get rid of something. You'd make the brush a little bigger than what you wanted to get rid of. You would just click once and it would go away. And that was great, but as soon as you ran into something like this, let's go up a little higher, you have even a stray hair, it was game over. At that point, you really had to jump either to Photoshop or to Photoshop Elements just to remove something small like that. So what they did was they took the technology and they, it now is pretty much acts like a brush. I make the brush just a little bit bigger than what I want to remove. Just trace along the, the, the little hair here, and it, it removes it. Now, it shows you in, in a different way than Photoshop does. Photoshop, like when you use the spot healing brush, it picks an area to sample from and just dares you to guess where it is. Uh, here, it always shows you. So if you don't like the area where it's sampled, you can actually pick it up and move it. And you see how it says, this is the area where I'm sampling from. It draws an arrow over to the part where it, it, it's changed. And you can just kind of move this. Now, if this gets on your nerves, seeing these on screen, if you press the letter H, you can hide them. So you can just kind of temporarily move them there. And it actually does work like the healing brush. It's just seeing this on screen gives you a, a better idea. It's tricky on faces because if you look at someone's face, we have skin texture that changes as you move across the face. Like the skin on your forehead uh, kind of goes horizontal. And then as you get to the bridge of your nose and, and as you go around the face, it, and so, like if you're working on removing like the classic power line in your landscape photo, it's actually a no-brainer. But I think it's really important to be able to see these when you are doing like a portrait retouch because there will be times where it, it thinks, and it's been kind of fun and you'll see as I'm working with this, where I go to remove something here and it says, oh, you want the sample place to come from her chin? It'll just choose some wild spot every once in a while. So the, being able to move and choose the spot that you think is the right skin texture really makes this very, very easy. All right, so that's basically how it works. You're just gonna paint like you do the, the real healing brush in Photoshop. But I wanna, now that you know what it does, I wanna show you some other things that we can do with it and different ways we can work with it. For example, um, realistically removing wrinkles. So let me go to a different image. Let me just click off of this. All right, like this the guy. Now, when we think of removing wrinkles on someone that's young, or like, you know, if they're under 30, we will basically, by default, remove all their wrinkles. And we can usually get away with that. But as soon as someone gets over 30, and you guys have seen this before, you'll see somebody retouch someone who's like 70 and they don't have a wrinkle on their face. And it's just, a, it's creepy looking. And, but here's the bad thing, it's not just creepy looking, but if you remove all the wrinkles from somebody's face and you give it to your client, right, they look at it and they go, 
man, this is, this is great. I love this shot you took of me. And you're like, well, thank you. And their friends look at me and go, oh, yeah, dude, that's you. <laughs> yeah, that's you. Your friends, they may even say it in front of you, but the worst thing would be that you've done a retouch for a client and their friends are laughing at them behind their back. So as soon as they get a little bit over 30, we don't want to remove their wrinkles anymore. All we want to do is reduce them. Now, I had a way where you could go to Photoshop and go through adding a layer and doing all these different things, but it's so much easier in Lightroom using the healing brush. So let me show you how it works. We'll just take one of his wrinkles here because, as you can see, he has many. Not like me. He has many. Well, you know what I call wrinkles. What do you call them? Signifiers of experience. Ooh, I like that. Yes. So he has a signifier experience right here. <laughs> we're going to remove his signifier experience. Uh, we're going to grab the, the uh, spot removal tool here. And we're just going to make, I always make the brush a little bigger than what I want to remove. Okay? And we'll just kind of trace down this little line. here. Now it's going to pick a spot where it thinks, oh, I didn't actually pick too badly of a spot. Here's the good news about this. It doesn't have to be perfect for the technique I'm about to show you here. Like, you know, I was kind of careful to move it to a good spot when I was trying to get rid of a little, but for something like this, for this particular technique, where we're not trying to remove the wrinkle, we're trying to reduce the wrinkle. And what it is, is as we get older, these wrinkles, these, um, what do you call them? Signifiers of experience. These signifiers of experience get deeper and you get more experience as you get older, right? <laughs> all right. So can you go to all my seminars and feed me lines <laughs> like this? This is great. Um, just uh, it, it, They get deeper, they get darker. So our job is to, to, to reduce, not remove. So I'm going to press the letter H so you can see it's gone, but it's not perfect. It's not like a wonderful removal. But here's the good news. For this technique I'm going to show you, it doesn't have to be spot on the money. Here's why. As soon as you remove the wrinkle fully, and what I would do is I would remove all of his wrinkles and, and make him look creepy. But then what you do, you go over here to opacity. It has an opacity slider. So watch, if I drag it from 100 down to zero, the wrinkle's fully back. So look at his forehead. See, it's fully back. At 100, it's fully gone. We get to choose exactly where we want. We want a little bit of that wrinkle to come back. But when the wrinkle comes back, it's not as deep, it's not as dark. And instead of taking 40 years off them, which looks ridiculous, you can take four years off them or 10 years off them. And you can do this just by how far you drag the opacity slider. So at zero, he's an old guy. At 100, he's 14. And then you decide in here basically where he winds up being. So somewhere look around like 70, taking off 75% of it. It's still there. It still looks like him. But it's, it, it's a realistic wrinkle removal. You have to do that right away, like fade in Photoshop, or can you do it anytime? Well, actually, thank you for asking. You can you can do it immediately, or if you I do another one, let's take a look. We'll just drag another one here. We'll just log it in here. We'll get this big one now. If you that wasn't very good. Let's bring it back. Yeah, I don't like I don't like where see where it actually chose another wrinkle to replace the wrinkle with. That's why no, this is why this is great. This is why you need to be able to grab this and go, no, don't actually create the wrinkle multiplier. Sample from here or sample from someplace else. Now, if you look, the opacity was still set at that low number, which is nice. As you're painting, it'll all paint them in at like 75% less. But in some cases, you're going to want to go in here and change it. But you can move from pin to pin and change it later. So you could go through, and here, here's a, a good workflow. Do one, remove the wrinkle, and then dial in how much you want of the wrinkle. Like let's say you bring back 75% or something. Or, so it's a 25% reduction in wrinkle. Uh, it'll stay on that opacity as you move to different ones. And then if you want to change to none and change a different one, you, as you click on them, you can just bring them back. There we go. So you have complete control over wrinkles. Now, you can also do this. I'm going to use the same technique for something else. We're going to zoom over to the next one. Let me get rid of that. We'll hit the Done button. For hot spots, see these shiny areas that appear on her face? So let's get rid of a... Uh, shiny area. I'm just going to take this one right here and get rid of that. It chooses a spot over there and the hot spot's gone. But the problem is we don't want to lose the highlight in her hair. We just don't want her to look sweaty. We don't want that, that highlight on her forehead is important. So over here you go to the opacity. All right, there is, it's completely gone and looks fake. Here it's completely black, back. So I start at zero and I just move up until the shine's gone right there. So now I still have the highlight. It's still in place but the sweaty part's gone. I can do the same thing on her cheek if I like, let it pick. Well, see, I would decide, hey, how about your shoulder? You go, no thanks. How about 
right next to her on her cheek. Okay, there we go. And then again, you're going to go in here and just slide all the way down. You can see the shine. And I just pull it back. Watch the opacity as I'm just pulling it back just to where I have the highlight. So there's another way to use the healing brush. And um, there's also a, another tool. I'm going to show you two more tools that are kind of linked to this. Uh, there's a brand new tool that helps you visualize spots. Now, you can always tell if it's one of my photos because there will always be sensor dust. That's kind of how I've made my, my mark on the photographic industry, is making sure that every photo I ever do has sensor dust. Now, if you see me point to an area and you don't actually see sensor dust, like you're like, I don't, know, I don't see it there, it's because there's actually just so much junk on my screen, I can't really tell what. It's like I have to wipe off my screen with my thumb because there's so much junk on there. There you go. But you see a couple of them here. But you know what? You, there's nothing more heartbreaking than to make a big 24 by 36 print and think you got the two or three that you saw. When you go to print, every little dot jumps out of you. And that's you, know, you think, wow, I just wasted all that ink. I just wasted that paper. You want to take it up a notch? Do it for a client. And have a client go, are these spots, these spots supposed to be in this ad in the magazine? That's a really hard conversation to have. So I used to show people a way we would use, I would have them draw this, this curve that made it, it look like solarization and all this, and it would help find it, but not in the way this thing that actually is part of the spot healing brush does. So if you go and choose the spot healing tool, at the bottom of the, the, the um, window, there's a thing called visualize spots right down here. It's just a checkbox and a slider, all right? And then uh, if you turn it on, hit this button, now, see how few spots you see? Wow, here's the deal. See this little slider down here? This is the I want to see more sli spot slider. As you drag it to the right, you'll start to see, oh, look what I was going to miss. Not just that, it gets worse. I was going to miss all this junk on my image. So this thing is incredibly handy. So now while it's in place, you can go ahead and get rid of this junk with single clicks that are slightly bigger than what you want to remove. And then when you're done, turn off this visualization and all your spots are actually gone. Now don't take the sky, don't take clouds and things that kind of should be there. And I think I just, I'm erasing a dead pixel now. <laughs> Some things like that on my screen. And when you're done, you turn off visualize spots and stuff. And of course, this it'll print like this. You'll, when it prints, you'll have dots all over your image. No, of course, of course that just, that's just for you to see on screen. All right, I have one last little thing. Since we're talking about retouching, it's a little retouching trick. And uh, it is, it's a retouch that you'll probably use a surprisingly uh, a surprising amount. I'm going to have to go back to my retouching one here. And, and it is for making people thinner. Now, this was something that I used to do in Photoshop anytime I want to do it. So it, it was a, lot, a lot of times it was the last spot because it's amazing what people will pay to be thinner in for photography. And so, uh, go to Develop Module, or just click it away, either one. There we go, the Develop Module. We're going to go down to the... Uh, lens Correction. And they added a new thing called Aspect. And I'm only going to talk about it in one way. If you drag it to the right, it makes people thinner. Really thin? No, you just want to do it a little bit. You want about, you know, 10 pounds. Like, Boom, right there. Then if you click this constrain to crop, it'll automatically crop the image up. So it's just that little bit that you can charge about $700 for. There you go. It's faster and easier than Weight Walkers. Okay. So that's just a little quickie on that. Now, that's retouching. They all, I also got the, the, to be able to do, show you some things about the books module. And the books module uh, is, I, I love making photo books. Uh, how many of you have, have made a photo book of some kind? All right. Okay, good. So for those of you that haven't, it's built right into Lightroom, and they actually did a really, really, really good job with it. So uh, I'm going to start off by just, I want to give you just some quick basics. I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but I want to kind of get you going. My first tip to you would be get all your images done. Like pick your favorite images, put them in a collection, get them sharpened, get them all ready like they're final images before you go to the book module. While you can make edits while you're in the book module, if you need to edit something, you can just take that image, go straight to the develop, tweak it, and come back, which you'll see in a minute. Um, 
it, it really makes sense to go through your images, sort them, get them all ready, and now it, this, is, this is an output, it's the final thing. So you wanna make sure all your images are done. So I put a bunch of images in a folder, just some travel images in a folder, and then you go to the, to the book module. All right, now, what I would recommend to, to do is, uh, first you have to choose what size book that you want. They have a bunch of built-in ones. By default, it goes to Blurb, but you don't have to send your book to Blurb. You can save your book as a PDF. You can save your book as a JPEG if you want to send it to your local printer. And Julianne learned a tip before we even started today. So while there are built-in sizes here, right? They're built-in sizes, 10 by 8, 8 by 10, 7 by 7. If you wanted to create a custom size that is not one of these, but it was still either portrait or landscape or square, you can just go to the new page setup and, and do the pixel math to figure out how big would it be to make a 11 by 11 book or some size that doesn't, that would be a standard size but isn't supported by them. So if you want to send it to you know, somebody, you can, you can have a custom size. All right, here's what I would recommend. First, choose your size. They have different ones, hard cover, dust cover, a soft cover. I really like the soft cover. The nice thing about the dust jacket, if you're using, the dust jacket has a little bit more legitimacy, like if you really want to put this on a coffee table and say, I'm a photographer, get the dust jacket. And if the just, what's nice is they still print the outside cover, so if the dust jacket ever rips, you still have the inside cover as well. In fact, here's what they look like. Here's, I think I have a little thing here. I'm going to go to the develop module. So here's the different book sizes that they offer by default. There's the, the uh, hard covers and then soft covers, and I was lazy and actually didn't resize this cover to fit the book, but I still printed it. Anyway, don't look over there, look back here. Okay, now, what I recommend is this, choose all these, if you wanna find out, if you go to Blurbs, they, they, a site, they describe each paper in uh, excruciating detail. I like the premium luster myself, but I wanna just give you a tip. So at the end of your book, there is this logo. If you see that logo, you're saving money. You can turn it off, right? And if you turn the logo off, that little tiny logo on the last page, if you turn it off, they charge you like 20% more. So you actually get a discount if you let them put the logo. And the logo is real small, unobtrusive in the back. And they give, it's like, not 20%, it's like 18%. It's somewhere, have you done the math? It's like 18.6%. It saves money. Now, next thing you do, go to auto layout. Now for auto layout, I would recommend that you just click auto layout and let it put a book together for you. Here's why. One of the art of putting, one of the things that's an art, and I think it's the most fun part of putting a book together, is finding images that work together on the same page. Because you, put, you can look through all these different images, put them together, and they just don't look right. You'll put two together and you, you don't know why. But here's the great thing about auto layout. Let's just say, like in this case, I'll hit auto layout so you can see what it does. You just hit it and it goes bang and it makes a bunch of pages. You will go, and it's, it's random, it does them in whatever order, right? Uh, whatever order they're in the, uh, the film script, but it, it's, it just kind of puts them together however. You'll see certain pages that you never would have dreamed of before that you just look at and go, wow, that looks perfect, done. And I find out in a book with like 40 or 50 pages, there's probably 10 or 12 that are perfect, just like they are, just out of sheer luck. And they're probably pictures you wouldn't have paired together. So that's kind of nice, and you can change everything once it's put together. All you have to do is click on a page, go to this little pop-up, and you have all these choices. You can choose one photo, two photos, three photos, four photos, multiple photos, two-page spreads, whatever you like. So I'll choose one photo, I'll make it full bleed, and it instantly changes to that. And if you want to, you can see this is the full grid of the whole book. And by the way, I have a tip for you. When you're working with books, once you've started working in your collection, you don't need this side panel at all, period. Just hide it, and it makes it that much bigger. So when you look at a two-page spread, it's nice and big on your screen. But anytime that you want to change to a number of different photos, and you have all these different templates, they, they did a really nice job with the layouts, different sizes, uh, ones that have edges on them, and ones anything that looks like it has text beside it already has a text field ready for you to go. So there's just tons of different layout, little film strip you're looking. Don't ever use this one, by the way. That's Come on. Anyway, but... Uh, <laughs> They have all these different ones for and two photos, three photos, and really nice layouts all the way through. I think they did a great job of giving you a big variety of layouts, all right? So you go through here, and, and one, I'll tell you what one of my favorites is. It, it's, it implements in a weird way. Maybe Julianne will tell me I'm doing it wrong, but if you wanted to create like a two-page spread, and so I say, okay, I want 
to go to a two-page spread. I love the two-page spreads. Look, it, it's one picture that, that goes all the way across the double truck across the middle. You just click on this layout and it goes, but it actually creates a new page. It doesn't do the page you're on, it goes, hey, how about a new page? Even if these are blank and there's nothing there, it creates a new page. Generous. It's generous, thank you. It's generous with your money. It's trying to okay. help you. It's trying to help you. To help you. <laughs> try, try to give your viewer some negative space to calm down. These are good. Take a break. This is good cover. Okay. So anyway, here's what, what the two-page spread looks like. Now, I also want to give you a little trick. Every once in a while, depending on what camera or how you've cropped the image, I found that sometimes you'll put an image into a two-page spread and it will give you a warning up in the, up in the upper right corner. Where it'll basically, it'll give you a little like a warning sign. And, and what it means is there's not enough resolution to print this photo. It's just a little. Can I tell you a trick I've used so many times? And what it is, is rather than going trying to resize the image or anything, if you go to the two page spreads, the next one down, watch, it just puts a little white border around it. I cannot tell you how many times just putting that little one inch border around, all of a sudden there's enough resolution. I had it happen a dozen times where it's just, it's just a little tiny bit too big to fill it. Not, it's not way too big. So that's a couple others. And they have some nice ones too. Here's another one I use is just to go two-thirds of the way. And then you can put some text or a caption over here. So that's just a couple of little things about the layout. Also, when you're moving things around, if you want to reorder your pages, you can just select them and drag and drop them. If you don't like the pages you're on, you can drag and drop individual pages as well. So there's a lot of flexibility in how you lay them out. And the auto layout thing also, by default, they give you a couple of choices. Uh, their choice is basically, you know, left page blank, one photo on the right. They give you just one photo per page. And anytime you want to start over, just hit clear. If you think, ah, I don't like that book, and try again. And we'll choose one of the other presets. Uh, this one just puts a big old photo on every single page. It assumes you have no imagination whatsoever. Okay. See here, there's little warnings. The little warnings, like, that's ah, too much. Okay. Or, or this image is missing. It's either it's missing or it has never is only enough resolution. Hey, I want to go back to the book setting thing. Remember I told you about the, the uh, if you have an internet connection, it gives you an estimated price. It actually says how much the book is. It'll say like 54 bucks or whatever. And when you turn the logo off, it actually gives you the new price. So it's, it, it, it's great to be able to see. And you, you turn this thing on a couple of times and you're like, all, all of a sudden you become very happy with having a small logo in the back of the book. Because it saves so much money. You go from like 54 to 43, you're like, yeah, I'll let them put the logo back there. Then, so you, like, then you can use whiteout. Yeah. Just, then you take, a, you take your logo and you yep. stamp it on right over it. That's, that's not right. All right. Back to our image. So auto layout, what's nice about auto layout is, of course, there are the ones that Adobe gives you. They're presets. But you can go and decide how you want it to be. You can go to edit auto layer presets and you can say on the right side, I want to use a fixed layout. I want it to be one photo with a big border around it. On the left side, I want two photos, and let's make them both tall like that. Then you can save that, and any of these presets can be applied. Just start over and say uh, small left to right, and then hit auto layout. Okay, now I just want to give a couple more tips here. Uh, one thing that they did nicely in five, because they're adding some nice new things in five, and I know that's why you're, why you're here, so I want to give you some five stuff. Uh, they have these little buttons to be able to add photo text. So if you wanted to add some text over here, actually I'll switch to a different book. Well, let's, let's zoom over to uh, this wedding book here. Here we go. So I'll go to the front cover. And if you want to add text, you can just click and add text. And we'll, we can just write in the, the bride and groom's name. So the text stuff is actually very nice. Uh, we'll say, what are their names? Uh, it's uh, Michael. No, we'll put her name right. Courtney. I think I spelled her name wrong, which is typical for a wedding book. Uh, <laughs> Oh, there it is. No, there it is. Thank you. T and Y. Courtney and Michael. Now, you can't see the text, of course, because it's over this, but you can actually grab it and move it where you want it, so you can reposition the text just by grabbing it. If you go to the type panel, you can choose a reasonable color for it, like white. You can choose a reasonable font for it. Uh, I just bought this one the other day, 29 bucks, over at uh, myfonts.com. I love it. It is called Parfumery Script Regular. So 29 bucks, and then you can choose the size. So there's Courtney and Michael. And you can see by the font they're in love. And then if you want to add, if you want to add more text, you can add another line of text down here. So you can put the date, which is pretty typical for weddings. So we'll say that it was uh, June, uh, June 11th, 2014 or 13, and I probably wouldn't use that font. 
So let's go over here to uh, type again, and we'll choose something a little more regular, like uh, the Flash and Pro. We'll make it really, really small. But you know what's nice? You actually have typographic control. You can add spacing between the letters. And you can just bring this right up here. Now you notice it doesn't line up, right? It looks kind of crappy, right? So what you do is just stick your cursor in there somewhere. Hey, let's, you can make it bigger, right? We don't need to see this. And you can go all the way to a single page if you want. Well, this cover will only let you see it that big. Move your cursor over here and just hit the space bar. It's a very elegant way to design. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> hey, did I spell his name right? Hey, yeah. Okay. Oh, there we go. Julian. You, 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 you could do it with cell padding. You could do it with cell padding, which is much more complicated than just using the space bar. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> cell padding. Stop. Sorry. All right. So you can add text. Hey, I want to show you a great trick for the spine. So this is a hardcover book, right? Check this out. So this is a hardcover book. You actually do, you can choose a background color for that spine because you don't want it to be white, right? That would look stupid. So you go down here to the background, right? Go to the background and you can choose a background color, which is white by default, or you can choose a pop-up color, right? With gray, that's perfect. Um, but if you, if you leave here, you don't get to, what I really want to choose is a color from the image, right? If I could use a color from the image, then it would be a perfect match. But as you can see when I leave my cursor here. But if you're in here, just hold the eyedropper down inside there. And as long as you keep it held down, you can actually leave the dialog and choose a different color. I know, right? And then you can choose a color from the image. Just there you go. So that's just how to steal the spine color. And now you get to format the text as you would with Courtney and Michael and Love. Okay. Uh, wanna, oh, I do want to show you a little trick while we're talking about backgrounds. And I'm just going to wrap up here so that we're the, okay. they actually have time here. No, you're done. <laughs> Am I done? No, no. Oh, but he started like crazy late. Did you see what time Brommer got off? Oh, okay. He was like, oh, he's 20 something after. He's still going on and Julianne's drinking and stuff. So I got, I got like all day at this point. <laughs> hey, it's like Julianne drinking story was freaking 15 minutes. I got till, I'm not, till, I'm not done until five. Yes. And then you guys go on. Okay. <laughs> hey, give me your phone, by the way. Oh. All right. Time and me. Here we go. Put it right in there. <laughs> All right. Hey, I got this is a 30 second trick. I'm just about done. I should turn the pen over. It works better, I found. All right. We're going to go down here. Watch. Here we go. 30 second trick. If, if that. You guys were so generous. Like, take as long as you want, Scott. And then they turn on you. They give you a few tips, they help you out, and then they turn. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to go here. We are going to uh, pick. A three photo image. We're going to go three photos. And now they're writing nasty notes about me. You're writing notes back and forth? What is, am I going to have to call the teacher? All right. So we can drop a couple of pictures in here if we want, but you can also use a picture as your background. You can drag and drop a picture as your background if you like onto this image. I'm going to actually choose three photos on the right. Now, even though these photos have text on them, let's go to this one page. If you just click, the text goes away. There's just to let you know that you can put text there. And I'm going to grab three photos of the bride getting the groom his, uh, his tie on. They, apparently, grooms have a tremendously hard time with ties. Uh, we're going to add a graphic to the background. We're going to just drop in a graphic. And when you drag and drop a graphic into this little cell right here, you can lower the opacity and look, they fall in love. All right. And then we can grab another photo for the other side. We'll just grab uh, this photo. And then maybe, and once it's there, you can just choose a layout. You can make the background a color too. It's all good. And then they, they're looking this way. They really look like they should be on the other side. So what you can do is, again, if you don't like the order, you can swap it to where they're on the other side like that. So making layouts and stuff is, is really, really easy. I'm not even going to show the last one. Yes, I am, because it's five seconds. Besides this, it's five seconds. Besides this background of a back screen thing, you can actually use a graphic, so you don't have to use a photo. There's these little pop-up menus over here, and they came with all these little backgrounds already built in. Like for travel, they've got all these things, little elements that you can put behind your image. And for wedding, they've got one for wedding already, and it has little uh, things you can put in here. So let's change it to a single image. We'll make it a small square. That's a big square. We'll make it a small square. If you come up with a size that you really like, let's say we go to the cells and we come up with a size that we like really well. And move this up a little bit. Make it more of a square. 
If you find one you really, really like, and you're like, I'd like to use this exact one again. If you right click, you can choose save as a custom page. This is brand new in Lightroom 5. You were not able to do this in Lightroom 4. It lets you save your own custom layout. So when you say save as custom page, then you have a whole new thing called custom pages. And these are where you built your specific pages the way that you like them. And now your layouts are one click away by just clicking on them. It puts your layouts in there. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank right. you, Julianne. Thank you. Can I have your seat? You may. All right. OK, um, thank you for B&H for inviting me. I appreciate it very much. I love going by B&H and seeing that it's really like the number three New York destination for people. It's, it's always fun. Um, I'm going to show you something that um, I'm going to start a little uh, geekier, something that's going to help your, your workflow. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Woohoo! I know. Yay, geeky stuff. Well, this is, um, I'm going to talk about what's called smart previews which you want to use, right, because you want to be smart, okay? I think that when Adobe does can't come up with a name, they call it smart. Smart Sharpen, right? And um, That's so next time we can call them Mensa. Oh, yeah. Smart select. Anyway, smart previews are um, in light, up to Lightroom 4, you know, you could import your files, and if you wanted to suffer, you would build one-to-one -one previews. Right, which would help with the develop module with zooming, etc. And then, um, even if your files weren't attached to your computer, you could work in the library module, doing you know keywording, ranking, rating. You could make slideshows. You could do you know web galleries, great stuff. But what could you not do? You couldn't work in the develop module, which is really the most fun, right? Okay, you can work in the develop module, or you could keyword. Yeah, I'm choosing the develop module. So what smart previews actually let you do is they allow you to work in the develop module even if your files are not online. Huh, that sounds really odd. When would I want to do that? Anybody ever flown coach? <laughs> right? Exactly. You are on location, you did a shoot, you're so excited, I really want to work on my pictures. And you know you're going to get the middle seat. OK? So you can't have a hard drive hooked up. So that's one time when you want to use your smart previews. Another time when you want to uh, experiment or incorporate smart previews into your workflow is if you have a computer in your office and then maybe a computer in the studio. And you're like, oh, but I can't save my Lightroom catalog on a network but you can keep the Lightroom catalog on a fast external drive. And then if you're smart, you'd have your files in each one of those locations, and you, would, you could just work with them, and you don't have to carry around your files all the time. OK, that was an exciting introduction, wasn't it? Let's see what they look like. So what these smart previews are, are here's some techie stuff, and there will be a quiz at the end of this session. They are lossy, compressed DNG files that are 25, wait, 2540 pixels wide. Okay? Please don't ask how they came up with that number. 2540, that is the answer. Okay? And what they really let you do is, I'm in the develop module here, all right, and I want to work on an image. So I'm going to, uh, I'm in the, the grid mode. I'm going to jump into the develop module, all right, and I want to work on it. That's as far as I can zoom in on it. So, you know, I'll do a crop. Okay, we like that. I'll do a quick linear uh, gradient to really bring out the um, that moisture look so I can change the weather. All right. And I think that's all great. And now, I notice, if I look under the histogram, I've been working on the smart preview, all right? Uh-oh, where are my files? They're right here, okay? I know. So I've actually been working in the develop module, doing everything I need to do with my files not even attached, all right? Which is really convenient, and you just have to notice that that's where 
that it says Smart Preview here. Now, I'm in the Develop module. I could jump into, for example, the slideshow. I could go to the Print module, all right? Do I want to make a high-resolution print off of a Smart Preview? Of course not, because it's only 2540, 24, 50, 2540 pixels wide. And it's actually telling me here, can you see that little icon, that that is a Smart Preview file. All right, so I'm getting that little bit of warning. But what can you do? Besides being able to work in the develop module, happens all the time. You know, someone emails me, I need the file, you know, for an, for an article. I need a picture. I need to email it. I need to post it on Facebook or Behance. 2540 is plenty of information for all of those needs. So I can use them in a lot of my exports. I can't export to Photoshop, right? Because you'd be in big trouble. So notice if I come up to the export module, the edit module, all of this is grayed out, which is actually good because it would hurt me if I wanted to uh, use the lower res files. All right? I think these are actually fantastic, all right? Because I can do all of my creative work on these, um, I don't want to call them proxies, on these representations, okay? And I've noticed, actually, that the develop module is a lot snappier with um, the smart preview versus working with these high-res files, all right? So I'm just quickly, wait, 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 wait. Go do it. You will do it. Thank you. This is when I always get depressed about my lenses. Uh, would you like to buy a lens? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Katrine, that yes. actually, the 2540 makes a 10 and a half inch wide image at 240. Wow. So that's not really that bad. 10 and a half inches wide. So if you did have to make a small print, right? not a big print, but a small print, 10, you can go, you can make an 8 by 10 out of it. That's right. And uh, up until like recently, up until about 10 years ago, you know, that was considered almost a large print. Yeah. Oh, okay. Make an 8 by 10. So now I've done all of my uh, creative work, right? And I want to make a larger print. Oh, no. So all I have to do is, and this is really the best part of it, I literally just have to hook up my hard drive and do nothing, okay? It will actually find the file, and now notice how the histogram readout changed. See, now it says original and smart preview. Isn't that nice? Right? I like it when you the software takes care of me, right? <laughs> Versus loading it, finding it, ah... It literally knew where it was. And so if I, so that's, if I look at this folder, I now select it all. It's literally telling me under the histogram the status of all of these files. So in this folder, all of them have smart previews. Okay? And I love this. None of them are missing. So I got to that little dialog just by uh, selecting all. All right, now if I jump back down to this file and I go to the print module and it selected the different image. It's magic. It's magic. There it is. I could actually make a big print. Okay? So, where do these smart previews come from? I don't know. Where oh. do they? Oh, there's, uh-oh, three places. Two places? Well, I will tell you where they come from. Okay? So. Spain. Sp <laughs> Spain. <laughs> Okay, now you can, I'm um, going to jump, you can create the smart previews upon import, all right? So if I click import, and sure, I'll select a source, does it matter? Okay, now, so you can see here in your import dialog box here, it says build smart previews, that's checked. You can, there's a preference that you can check in your preferences to always have that turned on, or you could check it, all right? A little hint, when I'm working on like uh, higher res files, like off of full frame cameras, I prefer not to build one-to-one -one and smart previews at the same time. I cannot drink that much coffee. I mean, it just, the time continuum changes, right? All right, so you can build your smart previews on import. I'm going to hit cancel. What if you already have um, a folder and you're like, oh, smart previews would be so cool. 
you can actually select the images and in the library go under the preview option and build smart previews here. Okay, so we'll do that real quick. And I always turn that off, no. And now you can see I have a smart preview. So, and that, you, that the same import would happen with synchronized, you can do one at a time, etc. I'm gonna quit because um, we want to look at where the smart previews are stored. They're stored, oh, and I've gotta go find it. They are stored in your, with your catalog. If I did it right, did I do it right? Don't you hate it when people dig through their catalog? There we go. And I'm showing the wrong one. I hate this. Hang on, one moment, please. Whew. So, um, here's my catalog. Here are the standard previews, and here are the smart previews that I've built. Okay, so they're stored with it, and you want to keep that name the same, etc. You know, don't throw those out. Um, and they're about uh, about 20% the size of a standard one-to-one -one preview. Anyway, when would I be careful of using smart previews? Um, two times I would prefer that you did not use smart previews, even though I should end on a positive note, but I think it's good to have this little bit of reality check. Okay, so let me uh, eject my hard drive. So you can actually see the truth. Okay, now it's going to work off the smart preview. If I jump into the develop module, the two places where you don't want to really rely on smart previews is whenever you're using the detail tab. All right, that would be sharpening and noise reduction. Right, that makes sense because you're only looking at a 2540 pixel file versus ginormous for your full frame sensors. All right, so if you're really critical and want to do really fine sharpening or noise reduction, work on the real file. That makes sense? Do we feel smarter already? Oh, yeah. Good, good. And the next time, the other time I would prefer that you not use smart previews are on those pictures that like, I really should not even show this to anybody because it's that under or overexposed that you want to see how much you can rescue it. Like files that are really so extreme and you're going to have to like, move the, the slider so far to get an effect, you know, come on, give it a break. It's working on a lower res file, then the results might not match one to one. Does that make sense? And I've heard like people sort of complaining about it. I'm like, really? Okay, now the next thing I want to talk about is the, in the develop module, there's a fabulous new feature that admittedly we've been asking for since like 2008, the radial gradient. Okay. And the way you want to work it, like if you, you've got your images, you know you do your global changes first, right? Make the image look good, the basic panel. Then I would in most cases use my linear gradient tool to like, you know, darken down skies, open up the bottom. After that, radial gradient, okay? Because I can use the radial gradient to focus in on specific areas. And then if I'm truly desperate, I'd use the brushes, all right? And I'll say in public, I was never very good at using the brushes in Lightroom. Anybody else like that? All right? It'd be like, oh, I'll just go to Photoshop. So global, linear, radial, brushes, Photoshop. That's sort of the workflow. All right? And the beautiful thing about the radial gradients is how much control you have over them. All right? So I will just uh, grab any old image here and jump into the develop module. Now, in the past, there was, of course, a vignette, right? So I can vignette it, which was great if your subject was in the center of the frame. But we learned. That's not a good place. That's not a good place. That, good know, for target practice. A good, you know, it's just, it, you're not supposed to shoot like that. And so I can't move it. I have no control over it. So the vignette is going to be relegated to past features. So if I want to get to the radial gradient, I can either click on the little radial gradient or do a command or alt, option alt M. All right. And look at all the controls you have. Hmm, this looks very familiar. How familiar does it look? It looks that familiar. That all the controls and more that you have in your develop module you have now in your radial gradient. 
All right. So if you want to do a standard vignette with all these controls, what you want to do is you want to command option double click and you will get a perfectly centered gradient. All right. And so I can actually, I could bring down the exposure, etc. And now I'm like, oh, but my picture is not centered. You can grab it and just move it anywhere you want. All right. It's sweet. Yeah, I know. I got one. Wow. It's, this is really great. All right. And so I, I'm just darkening it down. Oh, let's go for a depressed German photo. That would, I can do that. It's the Black Forest. With my name, I can do that. Okay. I can. All right. But of course it gets better because was I walking around with a flash or an assistant? No. So what I want to do is I can actually add a new one and I'm just literally going to draw out another gradient and maybe I want to lighten this up. Oh my gosh, but you're working on the outside, Katrine. Oh, that's horrible. What you want to do is click invert so you can have multiple gradients. So I'm going to lighten up the flower. It's like fertilizer. Okay. Add a little clarity. All right. And now you can literally see how quickly you can make that, you know, that photo um, sort of glow. We have uh, the feather control here, all right? If you, if you take the feather to 100%, in most cases, you sort of erase your effect because it's such a spread. And if you uh, do a feather like this, you will see that when you print, you think, all right? But lots of times I'll literally use that no feather in order to position it just where I want it. And then do the feather, and you can see, if I hit Y, how quickly you can make a blah to blue blah photo. Okay, let me check. Oh my gosh, someone turned off my timer. I'm in trouble now. Okay, now, we're just bringing down the house. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... I, um, I think that, that the gradient is, is fabulous. I'm using it more and more um, than brushes. Um, okay, and another reason I like using it more and more, I'm going to jump in the develop module. Come here, little guy. Do a gradient. So what another thing I like about the gradient, the radial, okay, is let's bring down that exposure, right? And then we have the minus clarity. Minus clarity, in my opinion, feels like minus, like a soft focus effect. Or minus sharpness is a little closer to um, shallower depth of field. All right? And so, ah, what the heck, I'll do both. Now, if I want more of an effect, I can actually take this, and I'm going to command click, and now I have two of them, but I can't see them. Well, if you sort of move it, you could see it, all right? So now that's really too dark, isn't it? So I'll take the exposure off of that, but now even more negative clarity, all right? And so now we can see um, how muddy, how quickly you can make that photo really muddy, all right? But so you want to command or control click to duplicate your radial gradients. Okay, now, and finally, let me, I want to just, I can probably just uh, show you some of these gradients before I hand it over to Julianne, is, let's see if we can see them. I'm using these gradients here, and if I go into my preview, let me show you the original. Okay, so you can see I've used, this is the original on the left. And here's the one that I used the gradients on the right. So I darkened the edge a little bit. I lightened up this dead bulb, and I lightened up the apple really subtly. Can you see that? Is that working for you? Too subtle? Probably. Okay. But what I like about this is the amount of control that you have with all of these gradients. All right? And so you can literally see my edge vignette here. I can move it which I just really love. And notice you're moving it outside of the edge of the frame, and I can adjust it at any time. 
So I'm really seeing, I feel like these radial gradients are a little bit more, for me, they feel a little more darkroom-like, all right, versus brushing or painting. Okay, and so I can add a little clarity to that. And they're always live. You can uh, select how you want to see them, etc. So those are the two features that I'm really excited about, the smart previews. I do have a feature request, though, with them. Okay. I was doing housework yesterday, and I'd like to vacuum they, they my apartment and then put the vacuum clean or lawn mowing really small and then have it apply. Smart previews? No. For housework, it would be perfect. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. Uh, I mean, sure, Sharad is going to write that down. He'll get That's right, right on that. I'd like to apply smart previews to my life. Right? <laughs> okay. So, meant to work that in before, but I forgot. So, uh, experiment with the smart previews. The gradients are just gorgeous. All right? And the ability to stack them if you want more effects or softer effects is just really, really beautiful. And I find myself using the uh, dodge and burn brushes like very seldomly now because of the gradients. But could I use them in conjunction with the gradients? Yes, you could. Like, that's crazy. Yes, if I wanted to, I could. All right, Julian, what are you going to talk about? <laughs> Can I affect the inside of the gradient? I think I showed that, but I'd be happy to show that where, to you. Where was I? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, she showed it. I did. Wow. But, so let's say I want. I'm not saying to, it. I know. That's oh, good. no, 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 no. All right, hang on. I'm going to get rid of it because the little cloud's the best part of the whole feature. All right. So I'm going to make the outside darker and softer. Okay? And now I want to have a new gradient, radial. Right? Yeah. And now if I click the invert, right. it will infect. Uh, in fact, it will affect the inside awesome. of the gradient. And so you can cool. stack them. So you can use more than one. Yeah, you can use more than one, That's absolutely. Right. Okay, I could have sworn I showed that. Was she okay. drink? Yeah. No. no I, Stop is... it. All right, we're switching? Yes. On your market set? You guys fill. So when I first talk about upright, I want to make sure that you guys know the difference between lens correction and perspective correction, because it is important. In Lightroom 4, we had lens correction, right? So if we come down here to the lens correction area, you'll notice that it looks different in Lightroom 5. We've got this basic area, which we didn't have before. Before, the default was the profile area, right, where we could go ahead and enable the profile correction. But what happened with a lot of photographers, especially people that are new to photography, is they would look at this and they'd say, well, gosh, that didn't correct the perspective of my image. And they're right, it doesn't. Because this is only lens correction. All it's doing is it's got a profile and we make those profiles and we ship those profiles and we will automatically apply the correct profile for your camera make and model based on the EXIF data in the file, right? So we'll pair those up when you'd simply click enable profile correction, all right? But it's not going to correct the perspective. And one thing that I used to say, I used to like to not correct vignetting. How's that for a double negative? I used to like to keep this off because I liked that darker effect that you would get when you shoot with the wider angle lenses, you get the darkening, that vignetting. But the problem is, of course, if you crop this file now, right, if I tap the R key and we decide that I crop it like this, or even better, let's go back and we'll scoot this over, now I've only got vignetting up in this upper left, and so it's gonna be really hard for me to even that out. So I would recommend, if you're going to enable your profile corrections, go ahead and make sure that you're also decreasing the vignetting. And you'll notice that I just double click the word vignette in order to reset that slider, right? That works on all of the different panels over here. Okay, so we also had this option here for color, and that would remove your chromatic aberration, right? That's just if you've got kind of a, usually happens with the wider angle lenses, high contrast areas in the outside of the lens, less expensive lenses, you'll get it. It's just a mixed alignment of pixels where you get that kind of like, haloing where you'll get that green magenta fringe out there. And this remove chromatic aberration just takes care of that. All right, and then we have the manual area. But now in Lightroom 5, we also have this basic panel. So the basic panel, you'll notice that the first thing that you've got here is the ability to enable your profile corrections and remove that chromatic aberration. We encourage you to do that if you're going to use any of the new upright modes because the math will be better if you do it this way. So I'll enable the profile correction, I'll remove the chromatic aberration, 
And then we can scoot down here to upright. And you'll notice that there's basically four different options here. If I simply want to level an image and it's got a nice horizon like this, of course, we could do that using the crop tool and then going out and straightening it. But I want Lightroom to do it for me, so we'll just click level and it will level it for me. Oh, okay. So, but wait, there's more. <clears throat> All right, so we move to the next image. We've got a nice image like this where obviously I am drinking. needing to drink, drinking. No. <laughs> this is her. I said nothing. <laughs> See, they turn on you. They do. It's true, Scott. What you said is true. I know. They eat their young. <laughs> they, whoever they are. All right. Sorry. So I, it's you. <laughs> I also want to straighten this one. So again, I'm going to enable the profile correction, remove the chromatic aberration. And now this time, instead of just doing level, I mean, I can do level, but it doesn't do that much. I mean, it levels it, but it didn't straighten the buildings. Instead, what I can do is I can simply click vertical. All right, so I don't have to click level first. You guys should understand, when you click vertical, it levels and also tries to make any verticals in your image <laughs> vertical. Coincidence? <laughs> All right, so that's the vertical option. Now, if I wanted to, I could come in here and I could say, please constrain the crop, because I'm polite, I do say please. If, if Lightroom's not working, it's because you're not sincere. Mm. Okay, that's, so we'll go ahead. That's and, tweetable. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't do that. Tweet. If Lightroom isn't working, it's because you're not sincere. 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 Yeah. Yes. I and and Photoshop can smell fear. Yes. Quote of the day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll go ahead and just constrain the crop. Now, look, it really cropped it quite significantly. But if we tap the R key right here you can see that we can go in and we can refine that, right? So if I needed the base of the buildings or that van for whatever reason of those people, we can go ahead and scoot that around and do that kind of thing. All right, now let's go ahead and escape out of the crop there. And um, actually, you know what? I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to say don't constrain it to the warp and let's do it the original. Okay, so why am I doing that? Let's go back down to lens correction for a minute. Um, this is the vertical one. If you ever want to check and see if the lines are actually vertical, we do now have a grid, and we have guides as well in Lightroom that you can use as overlays. So um, one of the things that always confuses me in Lightroom, we've got the tools menu that have tool overlays, but those are for the tools, right? Like the crop tool, you can get a crop tool overlay. But if you think about it, in any other like Adobe program, if you're looking for guides or grids, they always appear underneath the view menu. So that's why they're there. So right down here, um, where we go to our uh, loop overlay right here, we can show our grid and our guides. And you'll notice there's a keyboard shortcut, right? So that's just Command Option O or Control Alt O if you're on Windows. And that will show this. And now we can see this nice little overlay. All right, now let's go back to the options there, to loop overlay, and I can turn on the guide as well, and you can see that that guide is just the crosshairs. In fact, let me turn the other one off for a moment. Turn off the grid so you can see here's the guide. But now how do we actually move that guide around? Well, if you hold down the command key, you can see that the center point of the guide enables you to click and drag it. So those are your guides. Now I'm gonna go back again and I'm gonna turn off the guides, and this time uh, we'll turn on the grid instead. Right, so now I've got my grid. Well, the same thing. See, we've got the nice little pop-up that comes up for a second. It says hold the command key for options, so it'd be the control key, obviously, on Windows. We hold that down, and now look, we've got a grid size and opacity. So if you wanna make this less opaque, just click. We've got the little hand with the scrubby slider up there. So just click there and go to the left, or go to the right to make it less or more opaque. All right, and same with size. If I click and drag to the left, we can get a smaller or larger grid. All right, so you'll notice here, Vertical did an excellent job um, straightening up this image. So let's go to the next image right here, and I'll just leave this on for a minute, the grid overlay, and I'm gonna click Vertical again, and you'll see that it does do a good job of, being, of converting it and making it vertical, making those verticals vertical. Ha ha ha, that's like actually using actions. The vertical makes it vertical. Only worse. I'm All right. I'm tweeting that. I just tweeted the other one. I'm tweeting. No, don't. No. You don't have to. All right. So here's the thing. Sometimes you don't want your images to be completely vertical, right? Because just visually, it won't look correct. It's not natural. It's not like a balanced conversion. So what you might want to try then is the actual auto. So auto is going to give kind of a less, it's not going to force those verticals 
to be straight up and down. So it's going to give you a more natural perspective of the image, and you can see with the grid overlay, they're not exactly straight, but let's turn off that overlay. I mean, it looks more natural than if I come down here to vertical. So it just depends on what it is that you're after. Then the one last option here is gonna be the full option, and watch what happens to the horizontals here. So it's not only gonna straighten the verticals, but it's also going to make my horizontals straight. All right, so that's what it does. It does a three, it does a full 3D correction. And of course, if we go to an image like this, you can just walk through them, right? Like there's the auto correction, it's not bad. There's the level correction, there's the vertical correction, and there's the full 3D correction. Yeah, so let's just go off. Uh-huh. Now, I'm not saying that if you're like two steps in front of the dog, you shouldn't move over two steps. I mean, we can still get out of the car, right? But if there was maybe another dog that was going to bite you and you couldn't get there because the fence, that might be what you want to do. All right. Now, some things that I haven't been doing. Look at what I forgot to do. I forgot to enable these both, and that is not good. But I did it on purpose, <clears throat> so I could show you this other feature. If you forget, and you don't have these options on, just like I did, right? They were off. You'll notice it says full, and it has done the calculation. And we store that information. We cache that calculation so that maybe if you come back, you know, in five years to this image and Lightroom's on Lightroom 10 or something, then it would still look exactly the same. Okay? So if you make a mistake and you turn these on, it's like, I don't know. I don't know what to do now. It's going to stay cached. That's why we've got this little reanalyze button. So you can click on that, and if, well, it just did reanalyze it, but it didn't make a significant difference to this image, but it would go in and reanalyze your image. So just know, if it says reanalyze, you might want to give that a try. You can always undo it if you need to. Okay, so then we also know, okay, just before we do the preset thing, um, running this full upright correction can do horrible things to people, just so you know. So the aspect option that Scott mentioned earlier when I was listening, it's really great for correcting when the full distortion really distorts people. Because there's this one demo, I think we use our corporate demo, where it's got this horse in it, and all of a sudden the horse's legs are like, Wah. they're like two inches long. So um, you can go ahead and you can change the aspect, and it either goes you know, taller and thinner or shorter and wider. All right. Okay, so we can make him... You know, there's actually another dog in the picture. Watch, in the shadows. Wait, get the exposure. See right there. Woof. All right. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> Sound um, effects, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. You Wolf. didn't know that? No, I didn't. Is that in five? It is. Oh. It's like when you delete something, it goes crinkle, crinkle. Yeah, same thing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, applying mm -hmm. this to more than one image at a time, because probably we want to do that. So there's two different, well, there's a number of ways that we can do this. Obviously, if I've got one image selected here, I can turn on the auto sync button, right? That's just a little light switch there. You flip on auto sync and then whatever you apply to one image will apply to all of the images. So we can come back down here to lens correction and I can go ahead and go to basic. We'll enable, remove, and then do auto. And it would apply auto to all three of those. Now, the great thing is when it does that, it's not going to apply the same transformations to each image. It's going to analyze each image individually and then apply the correct transformation for that image, right? So when I come over here, this did not have the exact same numeric transformations applied. It had its own adjustment made by the con from the contents uh, of the image itself, all right? So that's important to know, especially if you don't want to do the whole auto thing and instead you want to create a preset. Because if I have this single image selected here, and I select the auto upright mode, and then I come over here to my presets, and I click to add or create a new preset, you would name it something that you would remember, okay? And then over here where it says lens correction, look, I've got two options. I've got upright mode and upright transformations. If I turn on upright mode, then it's only going to save the fact that I did an auto, or I did a vertical, or I did a, what are my other options? Full or level, all right? I probably wouldn't want this either. And then we would put at the very end of this, UM for upright mode. Okay, 
Yeah, sometimes the jokes are just for me. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and move to this image then. And what would I do here? Because sometimes I might actually want the exact same transformation. Are any of you photographing any time-lapse photography? Maybe? Really? Okay. All right. Are any of you shooting HDR? What's HDR? High dynamic range, multiple exposures, same scene, one stop apart. Okay. So what we can do here, if I want to straighten this, because of the robustness of the algorithm, <clears throat> you wouldn't want to just synchronize them. Even though your camera's on a tripod, the math might be slightly different. Okay? It's a feature. So what you would do is you would enable, remove, and then apply whichever of these options you want. And then you could either synchronize them, or if we were talking like we were a second ago, you wanted to create a preset, you would come in here, and instead of using the upright mode, you would choose upright transformations. It will then apply those exact mathematical transformations to any images from there on. The other reason this might be really interesting is if you do, um, you know, sometimes they say like, well, if you're going to shoot something, you could shoot something with a white balance card, and then you take the white balance card out, and then you photograph a bunch of other stuff, and then you can just make the change to one, and it makes them to all. So sometimes, you know, the, the images that I am using to show the corrections have very strong horizontal and vertical lines in them. As your images have fewer and fewer horizontal and vertical lines, obviously upright becomes a little more difficult. It's harder for it to automatically straighten it. So you might have something in one image, and I don't know, you, maybe you're one of those people that like always shoots like this, you never want to bend down or bend up, you know, if you're like one of those, then good, This you might be able to use those numeric transformations. But you guys don't do that, because I'm sure you change your perspective relative to the scene all the time. <clears throat> okay, so that's enough with upright. Uh, the other thing that I needed to show you for certain is, if I go here to the uh, library module, um, going back to the library module, yes. And then we're going to come down here to my little gems here. Oh, no. How about slideshow and video still? So how many of you guys are, are shooting video as well? As Okay, so we know that in Lightroom you can look at your videos, you can trim your videos, you can capture a still frame from your videos, all that stuff you could do in Lightroom 4. Um, we also know as you get more advanced in video, you probably want to take those videos into Photoshop where you can basically do almost everything in Photoshop, and if that's if you're in CS6, you guys know that there is no CS6 extended, so you have all your video tools in CS6. CS6 allows you to, to you know, because you're already familiar with it, you then can do all those things you could do in Photoshop. But it is the gateway drug to Premiere and After Effects. So it's a great place to get your feet wet. Photoshop is, but then eventually you probably will want to go to, to Premiere and After Effects. But if you had a wedding or something and you just had a bunch of still images and you wanted to make a quick slideshow and you wanted to add a little bit of video, you can now do that in Lightroom 5. So obviously here's a little bit of video and we can play that video. Okay, the audio with my video is horrible. So uh, that's just the way it is. Um, I can mute that if I want to, like mute my whole machine right now, but I'm not going to do that because there's a feature in the slideshow. So let's go ahead and just go over to the slideshow. Oh, sh 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 Hush, hush, hush. Just for a moment, I'll mute it. I just want to make sure here that I only have 1,000, 1,000, okay, like three seconds. Yeah, okay, so that's great. So if I need to make this, um, if I need to set a new in and out point, we've got these two icons right here. Here's my little gear icon. This is going to allow me to slide these barn doors and make them either smaller or larger. You can also use Shift I for setting your in point and Shift O for setting your out point. All right, but when we've got our the small piece of video footage that we want. We'll just move over to the slideshow module over here. It brought over the collection of images, obviously, and now we can go up and I can either pick from a template or we can just set this up if we want to. Um, but basically, all I really want to show you is the fact that when we go ahead and play the slideshow, well, before we play it, let's go to playback, because I'm going to turn back on my audio now. If I pick a song like I have right now, I don't really know what that song is, so I should have... Let's hope it's a good song, all right? If not, we'll hum. Scott will tweet it. All right, so I've selected a piece of music here, and then you can see I have an audio balance. So if you are 
actually capturing decent audio, meaning that probably you have another device and you're not just capturing with the audio from the digital SLR. Can we just call them SLRs? Is it time? Yes. Yes, because there's more of them than, okay. All right, so if you've got your SLR and you're shooting your video and you're capturing the, the good audio, then you probably want to use this audio balance slider where you would say, hey, when the video plays, I want you to stop playing the music, fade the music out, fade the audio in from my clip, and then when it's done, fade that out and fade back in the music. If your audio is terrible, like mine is, I'm gonna say just keep on the music the whole time, right, because there's nothing important with this audio. So then we hit play, it's gonna prepare the little slides, it starts, oh. <laughs> Could be worse. Could be worse. This is good. All right. Uh, this is. A, I think I've got each one up for quite some time. Still on the first one. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Oh, we got some information mm. about it too. All right. Maybe it's I should have looked at my. Okay. Enough of that. Now, and the the poor sound crew's like seriously. I hooked up sound for that. That's what you needed sound for. All right. So this is just a template you can see right down here. I've added um, some, some text overlay, and that text overlay, if we select it, you can see uh, it's actually a bunch of equipment. So there's a ton of different options here that we can add in order to add more information. And of course, it's grabbing that from the EXIF data, so every single image that we show, that will obviously be updated. Okay. And I'm right. finished. Okay. Pretty yeah. cool. Let's do it in Lightroom, huh? <laughs> Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.